This is Open to Hope Radio, featuring Dr. Gloria Horsley and her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley, coming to you on behalf of the Open to Hope Foundation, dedicated to those who are looking for hope after loss. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show in partnership with the Compassionate Friends. I'm your host, Dr. Heidi Horsley, and I'm here today with my mom and co-host, Dr. Gloria Horsley. Hi, Mom. Hi, Hi. We've got a great guest today. We always love having Alan Peterson on, right? Absolutely. Alan is my favorite person, and a lot of you know him out there. He is a musician. He is the executive director of Compassionate Friends. And most importantly, he is Ashley's dad, and his daughter died in a car accident at 18 years old. And he gives so much hope to so many, Mom, doesn't he? He absolutely does. And we're going to give some hope and help to you Today, talking about the holidays and also getting into the new year, and we want to give you tips on how you can find hope and peace during this special time of year. Absolutely. And for those of you out there that don't know about the Compassionate Friends, it is the largest peer-to-peer support group in the world. They have almost a million members, and I am a member of this wonderful organization and on their board, and Alan is the executive director. So if you've lost a child, a sibling, or a grandchild, please go to their website and get support. So on that note, Mom, I want to talk to you about what we're going to do today. Um, We are going to talk with Alan about how you can remember and celebrate the life of your deceased loved one during the holidays. And we're going to give you tips on how you can find hope and peace this season. And welcome to the show, Alan. Thank you very much, Heidi. It's an honor to be here with you and and Gloria. I always enjoy uh, our times together. Uh, I learn from you guys, and I think we provide a lot of hope for people. So it's an honor to be with both of you today. Uh, It's great having you on, Alan, too. We love you. You know, one of the things I was thinking when I was thinking about this show is we've got three different perspectives today, and I think that's really important for people to hear because not everybody agrees the same. And Alan's a grieving dad. His daughter Ashley died. Uh, Heidi, a grieving sibling, and uh, our son, my son Scott, and Heidi's brother. So we kind of get uh, three different takes on on things. And, and one thing I want to say, too, to everyone is you do grieve the way you live. Do you, I mean, you, you're the, uh, you are who you were before. I mean, even though you've had this trauma and it does change you, if you weren't a lover of the holidays before or a lover of the New Year celebrating kind of thing, you're not going to love it after. So, um, you know, keep that in mind, too. We grieve the way we have in the past. And Try and the potential for coming back to where you were before is very high. If you were happy and enjoyed the holidays before, as time goes on, you you will find that you're coming back to those levels. Well, I think every you know I think everybody's so different. I think the holidays kind of shine a light on how we all grieve uniquely. I find it fascinating. I was one of those people who the first uh, a couple of holidays after Ashley died. Uh, and especially Christmas for me, I just couldn't do it the way I had always done it before. But, you know, I find other people who actually find comfort in keeping the same traditions they had. So I, I think that, you know, I've come back to where I enjoy the holidays, and I did enjoy them before. But I think it's a, an exercise in learning to be patient with ourselves to uh, examine, uh, you know, h- how do we want to do the holidays moving forward and knowing that There isn't a right way and there isn't a wrong way. Whatever works for you that helps you cope and survive, uh, you know, that's what works for you, and go with with your instincts on it. Heidi, what's your thought as a sibling? Well, I guess I would say that initially sometimes we don't recognize ourselves after, uh, after a brother or sister dies. I mean, because it does rock our world so much, it does change us. And like you said, eventually we get to a place of hope, and that's why we're here today, to offer hope. The other thing I would say is that a lot of times parents tell me, you know, I feel like I don't really want to have the holidays anymore. I kind of want to just stay in bed and put the covers over my head. The problem with that is that sometimes people have surviving children. And we as siblings feel like if our parents don't have holidays, we feel like we've been punished because our brother or sister died. And it's like, okay, now we get punished too. Our whole life comes to a halt and our life is forever destroyed So what I want to say to parents out there is the holidays mean a lot to kids. And sometimes you have to figure out a way to get through them for your surviving children. And we'll give you tips and tools today on how to do that. Right. 
And I think it's important to talk about um, the first couple of years for people who are listening to this, too, um, because that first year you grieve for what you've lost, you grieve for your child, has been my experience, or your um, sibling or your grandchild or whatever. And then that second year you really grieve for yourself. And the first year is totally frozen. Most people I talk to tell me that first year they don't even remember much about it at all. Because, you know, it's the fake it till you make it, and and you're in that frozen grief. You know, what I remember about the first year is that some of the things, you know, because we had, uh, you know, other children, we were kind of forced to go through the motions, I guess, and that's kind of what you're describing. We were frozen. We couldn't feel or think. We just knew it was awful, the anxiety of it. But, But we did have other children, and there were some things that we had to do. And looking back, I would have to say that maybe that was a good thing. It forced us to to get out of bed and put our feet on the floor and at least go through the motions. And don't know how we did it, but but we still somehow pulled it off. So, uh, but yeah, you're numb that first year. The next year, the anxiety of it coming. I think was worse than the day itself. It's really, really look forward to the holidays, and especially if you've had the loss of a sibling. Your life has been turned upside down, and you're in such a difficult place. It's nice to take a break from your grief and have Christmas or have Hanukkah and celebrate the holiday um, during that day if you're a kid. Um, I don't remember the first year, though. I have to be honest with you. It's like you guys are saying it's a fog to me. I can't remember what we did. I know we had Christmas as usual, but I don't remember what it felt like or looked like. Yeah, I was uh, working in the field of grief and loss at the time, so we just paced through. The idea was do what you do, the, what you've always done, because you're unconscious anyway. So I think that's what we did. I hardly remember. But, Alan, you got into the second year, and I was talking to a woman yesterday who said, I'm in my second year, and it is really rough. Because for the first year, I was on automatic pilot this year. Yeah. I'm starting to feel better and face the loss, and that's how it was for me. And I was grieving for myself, you know, the fact that this is a loss. And people tell me, they call me during that second year and they say, I feel like I'm going crazy. And, you know, it's a paradox because you're getting better. Uh, you're thawing yeah. out. You're starting to move on. You're starting to deal with things, and it is rough. I think in that second year, you describe it really well. We are getting better in the sense that now we're looking at, you know, it, it, it. we feel it more fully. So we understand that something's broken that may never get fixed, but we're able to comprehend the loss, which makes it more difficult because it's real and raw. But I also think that anxiety, um, many people tell me, and they probably tell you both the same thing, that, you know what, the thought of Christmas, just that whole month leading up into it, or Hanukkah or a holiday, was so stressful for me. But then when the day actually came, it was sort of like, okay, maybe I, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. So it messes with our mind. I feel like if someone hasn't had the death of a sibling, which none of my friends had ever had that, they don't get it. And they don't understand why. I mean, I was 20 when Scott died, and my sisters were both teenagers, and no one understood why two years later we would still miss him. You know, because my friends hadn't had a stepbrother or sister die. They didn't understand that concept that two years is a very, that's newly bereaved in our world. But in the world of non-griever, non-bereaved people, that seems like a long time. And the other thing I wanted to say, and I know you can both relate to this, the second year was hard for me because I kept saying over and over in my head, I can't believe this is permanent. I can't believe I'm not going to see him again. This is so weird. This is so surreal. He was only 17. Ashley was only 18. How do teenagers suddenly leave our lives forever? It felt really strange, and it was so permanent. The second year, like you said, permanent sets in, the reality of it. Yeah. Well, let's move quickly through the third year is the realization this is going to be your life, and then in that fourth year you start beginning to develop uh, new patterns, new holiday patterns, a new normal, maybe doing some different things during the holidays. But what I want to do now that we've kind of covered the first four years is to give some tips to people for survival. I mean, what are some of the things that we can do to help ourselves? Well, according to the research, gratitude is the number one way to change the way we feel. Um, Being grateful and talking about what we're grateful for or sending people a note saying, I'm grateful for you. And my mom always says, you always say, mom, you know, it's hard at the beginning when we've had a loss to feel grateful for anything. 
So you might have to start out small. Like I'm grateful that I had a hot cup of coffee today. I'm grateful that my water's running. I mean, it has it could be small. And then, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I say, you know what? Although it was hard to lose Scott and I wish he was here, I'm really grateful that I had a brother for 17 and a half years. Mm-hmm. And and maybe just even opening your eyes in the morning and matching your socks. Alan, another thing that actually changes the brain is hugging and touching. And you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate in that early on in my grief, I found the Compassionate Friends. I found a great grief program, which which uh, I really learned to try to find gratitude even in the first year. As crazy as that might sound, there is gratitude. And the Compassionate Friends, uh, you guys probably know, about ten days ago, December thirteenth, we had our uh, worldwide candle lighting, and to be able to go to a worldwide candle lighting with others and hug them and share their stories and you know, really hugging ourselves, just being kind and gentle to ourselves is very therapeutic. Being around people who understand our loss also is. So I'm a big believer, and I'm glad I learned that early on, that I needed that connection of people and to take care of myself, uh, especially in those early years when it is about survival. Mm-hmm. And Heidi, even shaking hands, right? Absolutely. Shaking hands with people changes the way we feel. We feel more socially connected, and you only have to do it a few seconds a day. It doesn't take a long time. And, you know, the hugging piece also, if we hug ourselves, I think we said that, but if we hug ourselves, that yeah. changes the way we feel. We don't. It doesn't have to be somebody else. And let's talk about laughter quickly, um, you know, because these are brain-changing things, mm-hmm. actually. Gratitude and hugging and laughter actually change the chemistry in the brain. Talk about laughter a little bit, Alan. Well, I think, you know, if there's anything when you're grieving, the thought of laughter is is sometimes it's disgusting to you. You're like, you know, you feel guilty. The first time you just laugh inadvertently, uh, you you feel like there's something wrong. But it is healing. It's freeing. And, you know, um, grieving people laugh. A lot of people, you know, they talk about support group meetings like they're just the most down thing. But you will hear lots of laughter in a support group meeting when we start talking about our children and start sharing stories of our children, our grandchildren, whoever our our loss might be, and we find funny stories and we laugh. And it is freeing and it's very healing. And uh, I've always made laughter a part of my grief journey, and I'm so thankful that I learned early on that it's okay to laugh. It's okay to cry. It's okay to laugh. They're next-door neighbors. Laughter and tears, they don't live on the opposite end of the street. And when you embrace both in your life, I think it's very human. And Heidi, talk about smiling. I mean, making yourself and putting a straw in your mouth. I love that. I was just thinking that, Mom. You read my mind. Seriously, because I have a pen in my hand. And again, (laughs) the research shows this is kind of crazy. But if you take this pen that I have, I'm sure a lot of you have pens close to you right now. And you put it in your mouth and you smile with it in there and you hold it there. In a few seconds, you will feel better because when we're smiling, it tells our brains that we are feeling good and we are feeling happy. And I'm looking at my producer right now, Bob, through the camera, and he's got a pen in his mouth and he's smiling. And I bet he feels better. <laughs> Heidi, remind people, don't put the end with the ink in your mouth because it will turn your lips all blue. I tried that. Then all you right. might go from smiling into laughing, Alan. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, well, let's do a little uh, one more thing that you can do for yourself, and that's exercise. And let's just have people raise their hands, arms above their head, right? Everybody raise their arms above their head. That can actually change your energy levels. Yes. Well, if you snap like 30 times, if I ask you to snap your fingers 30 times and you counted it. And it has it, to be each hand, right, right, and left at the same time. Yes, and you're, you counted it. It changes your mental resilience. It makes us more mentally resilient. And again, our producer Bob is doing it, and I think I see through the camera his <laughs> mental resilience changing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and I want to say that walking 20 minutes a day will reduce your risk of stroke by 50%, if you can believe that. Because, you know, grief is stressful. It, it is hard on your health. So you do need to take care of yourself. I want to say something that will change the way everybody feels about cleaning their house, especially cleaning their toilets and their bathrooms. 
if you tell yourself before you clean your house, I am now exercising, when you clean your house, you will burn more calories because it gets your mind into the exercise mode. So next time you're cleaning your bathroom, et cetera, think, hey, I'm exercising. It's not as painful to clean your house if you actually think you're exercising also. I think all these things that you know we're talking about here, they might sound silly to some people, mm-hmm. but they really do work. They are effective. And, you know, we can't stay in that bottom place of grief all the time. And, and these things that help bring us out of it and help give us the respite, even if just for a while, uh, are great for our brain, they're great for our emotions, and they work. And so, uh, as silly as it may sound, I invite people to try each of those things we suggested today. And then have a chocolate chip cookie, because that works too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, why don't you talk about... I think music is a two-edged sword. For some people, it brings out the rawest of emotions, and it takes them a while to embrace music. I'd been a songwriter my whole life. When I actually died, I said I'd never write another song. Till one day, I picked up the guitar and started writing my story of Ashley and being a dad and being in love, madly head over heels in love with this child for 18 years. And I started writing that story and then writing the story of her dying, dying too soon, and then trying to find my way back to life. It was healing for me. I've been blessed on a candle lighting night in December to just know that thousands of people around the world are listening to this song we're going to play today. I didn't write this song. I tell people that God wrote it, Ashley wrote it. It was a gift given to me for all families who've had a loss of any kind. And it's just about the power of holding a candle. And there's just something special about that. And so, but music's been healing for me, and I know it is for a lot of people who embrace it and bring it into their life and helps them go to an emotional place they may not be able to go to otherwise. I love this, Alan. And when people are listening, I want you to celebrate the time, the life that you had with the person on the earth and feel grateful that they were here. And, you know, although we are so much poorer for having lost them, we are so much richer for ever having known them. So thank you, Alan. Thank you guys so much. I enjoyed being with you. It's been great being on, and I hope everybody will pick just one of these brain-changing self-care ideas that we've given you today and take care of yourself during this holiday because uh, grieving is a tough tough thing, and our hearts are with you. And Heidi and I always want to say, if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own, and God bless. Right, Heidi? Absolutely. Have a peaceful holiday. Tonight I hold this candle In memory of you Hope in some way, somehow My love will shine through I close my eyes Lost in the glow There are so many things I want you to know This candle says I love you This candle says I miss you This candle is saying I remember you I'm holding it toward heaven It feels like you are near If you're looking down tonight And see this candle burning bright It says I'm wishing you were here In the glow of this candle I can almost see your smile and it carries me away for a little while to another time another place when 
all it took to light up my world was your beautiful face. This candle says I love you. This candle says I miss you. This candle is saying I remember you. When I'm holding it toward heaven, it feels like you are near. If you're looking down tonight and see this candle burning bright, it says I'm wishing you were here. Someday, some way, I'll see you again. I'll hold you in my heart until then. This candle says I love you. Yeah.